previously on Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. Abduction and murder kind of really became real for me at that moment because, you know, even even someone that was reading true crime at a young age and, and watching it on TV at, at a young age, I was still young enough at that time that it felt like more of a movie than real life, right. you know, and, and reading it in books felt more like this is just a story somewhere. Some people that I've never, never knew, never will know in a place that I may never go. Do you think you'll have a sense of closure? Or That's that... always been, uh, we talk about that a lot. We think they're getting closer. We think they're getting closer. We don't know. We, that's always our uh, carrot in front of our, the in front of our face, you know, to, that they're getting close. We were on the phone today with scientists, myself and, and some of the detectives, scientists from various organizations, in an effort to take what we have as far as science goes in this case and forensics goes in this case and move forward to, uh, to something that might help us make an identification or a resolution. That's ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for the next, until we figure this thing out. Uh, if it takes years or maybe a couple of days or a couple of hours. But that's been a process that, that we've kept up with, I believe, as DNA has progressed and we continue to keep up with that and make submissions, inquiries, uh, in the hopes that uh, science will help us resolve this case. And this has never been a cold case? This has never been a cold case. It's always been an open, worked case. And, uh, you know, for, for a lot of different people over the years. I am Bill Huffman, and welcome to Episode 8 of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. On this week's show, I will wrap up my great conversation with Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast and discuss more suspects with true crime author James Renner. Renner has written extensively about the Mihaljevic case, and he has his critics, but he has also kept this case in the spotlight and puts himself out there when discussing suspects. Renner will talk about some of the suspects that could have committed the crime, but for one reason or another, they have not been charged in this case. You know what's weird, and I don't mean to jump around on different cases, but a case that's still unsolved, the Delphi murders, the double murder of uh, two, uh, two teenage girls in Delphi, Indiana. Mm-hmm. When it came out that they had a picture, now mind you, it's grainy, it's from a distance away, but when they had a picture of him and they put it on the news and they put it on the internet, and then they had his voice. I thought for certain, I, I, I said to everybody that was willing to listen to me, I would be looking, I would be checking suicides in the area and, and the states bordering Indiana. If somebody, if a man offs himself, I want to know who he is, where he's from, and what was he doing on that day? I think that was a... Um, Valentine's Day or Martin Luther King Day or one of those holidays um, that the kids got out of school early or didn't have to go to school. I want to know what he was doing that day uh, because I think I thought for certain and and it may have happened and maybe we just don't know. But I think that I thought for certain when they showed his face, Mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a drawing of him from a child's recollection like we're talking about with Amy Mihaljevic. This is an actual picture of the dude's face. I thought for certain the pressure would get to him and he would kill himself. Um, With Amy Mihaljevic, we have the situation where we have children who saw the individual that leaned in and whispered or leaned over and said hi to Amy. And I've always found it intriguing that he said to her, Amy. And I, I always felt that that was, again, more proof to me that he knew her but didn't know her directly. He knew her information, but he didn't know her directly. He had never had face-to-face interaction with her, one-to-one interaction with her. I think he didn't say Amy like he was calling her name, like I would say to you, Bill, to get your attention. I think he was saying, Amy, like if like when you and I met for the first time, I didn't say to you, Bill, mm. to get your attention. I said, Bill? Like, are you Bill? Because I've never met you face to face. Now, yeah, he may have seen her picture. He may have seen her school photos. 
um, or he may have drove around and followed her and seen her from afar, but she was not the only 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old girl at the plaza that day. Mm-mm. I think he leaned in and I think he said, Amy, for confirmation that that was in fact the girl that he targeted and was looking for. If he lived in Bay, he wouldn't put himself out there. I mean, he's already put himself out there with the phone calls, but like you said, they'd be looking for this guy. And this isn't New York City. Bay Village has a population of around 15,000 people. So we're not talking massive, you know, massive amounts of people. But one thing that Spetzel said is they followed up on so many lookalike leads that if it was somebody that lived in the area, you had people calling in saying, my neighbor looks like this guy, or I think it's my brother-in-law, or, you know, there just were so many different things that just would come in because of the lookalikes. And Spetzel talks about, he's like, we, you know, we didn't really want to release the picture because we didn't feel like it was unique enough Mm -hmm. because so many times you do that and it does lead to just lookalike leads and you end up chasing your tail. But He's like, hey, we had nothing else to go on, so we had to release it. So, right. it, you know, reluctantly. I mean, obviously they would have released it at some point, but I think that they were they were hoping to gather more information before they released the composite sketch because it was a few days after the abduction where they made the sketch available. And so I mm-hmm. think there was some internal discussion there about, you know, have we gotten anywhere with what we have and do we need to do this? And I think they had to do it. Well, and like, you know, like most FBI profilers would do, I like to play the numbers game. I like to, re- to go back to my knowledge and my understanding of crimes that are solved and look at what the numbers tell me. And the numbers tell me this, a child that is abducted by somebody that they know or somebody that lives in the area or somebody that lives near them, the overwhelming majority of the time, the perpetrator waits for an opportunity when the victim is alone and snatches them, grabs them. It's a, it's a, it's like a smash and grab robbery. Mm. You know, you, you do it as fast as you can and you take the individual and That's not what happened here. This individual knowingly and prepared and arranged a meeting at a public place with Amy. Yeah. I mean, the the intention was to take her and Mm -hmm. it it was obviously for sexual purposes and the authorities are convinced on that. And the amount of effort this person went through to, go through to perpetrate this crime you know you just have to wonder what i don't think this is the type of person that's going to kill himself just because of the fact that he thinks he's smarter than everybody well he's got away with it this far or this long yeah that's that's where i go back to um different takes from different experienced law enforcement individuals and you'll hear them especially when they talk about serial killers and and other killers um they often are you look to 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 kill somebody or to it's one thing if it happens if it's a crime of passion happens in the heat of the moment but to knowingly and willingly plan to murder someone I believe, and I think a lot of people may agree with this, I think you have to be some kind of egomaniac. And what I mean by that is, obviously, you think your wants and needs are much more valuable than this person's entire life and world and existence. So everybody they're connected to. And everybody that they're connected to. So therefore, I think you have to be an egomaniac. Then you can take that two different routes. You have some law enforcement individuals that would say, well, an egomaniac won't kill themselves because they they think too much of themselves. They value themselves too much to kill themselves. You have others that would say that's the ego. They would kill themselves because that's the egomaniac's form of control, of controlling 
a situation that he or she may believe is getting out of their control. So there's two different thoughts on that. I, I'm with you, though. I, I tend to lean to, I think this was um, um, very much a one-off killing, and I think that that has helped the offender. I think that, it, you know, we both know anytime you kill and kill again, you're upping your risk of getting caught. Right. Um, I think this was a one-off, and that has helped the offender. I also think that the, the killer is, is, is alive, and my gut, I know I gave a long answer earlier, but my gut tells me he's somewhere in the northern half of Ohio. No, that's kind of the way I feel about it as well. I do think that he's still living amongst us and aware of the podcast, aware of all the stories that are out there about him. And I think he's, I hate to say it, reveling in it. And I can't wait. Well, I like... I like that you addressed him on the show. I like that you, you had a message for the killer and um, where he might be taking some enjoyment and some satisfaction, knowing that he knows something that we don't know, Mm -hmm. knowing that he has a secret, knowing that uh, or believing that for now he's outsmarted the police at the same time he knows and has had to watch his back and look over his shoulder for a very long time. As many moments that he thinks that he's better or smarter than the rest of us, or that he has some important secret, there's just as many moments where he's been scared, he's been terrified, and he's thought that they're one step away from getting me. And that statement has never been more true. They are one short, tiny step away from apprehending this individual. And so... Let him feel good half the time, but know that the other half of the time he's scared to death and he should be because there's a lot of us and there's only one of you. Technology, you can't outrun it. Right. It's uh, DNA and technology. And unfortunately your days are probably numbered for you, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. fortunately for us, one less uh, boogeyman off the streets. And And if I could have a prayer answered, it would be that this individual is apprehended and convicted before, uh, you know, Mark Mahalovic is getting older. Um, Mm -hmm. You and I were children. We were roughly 10 years old when Amy was abducted and killed. And Mark was already an adult. He was, you know, her father. And he's, uh, he was an adult then. And and I don't know his age, but I think he was, he was what in his mid thirties back then? 33, 34. Yeah. So it's been 29 years in a couple of weeks, 29 years. So mm-hmm. he's in his sixties now. Uh, my, my, my hopes and, and, and prayers are that this individual is caught and convicted so that it's not closure. Mark said it best. There is no closure for no. something like this. You just accept it at some point that it happened and it was out of your control. Mm-hmm. but it's the not knowing too that, that eats away at you. And I, Mark deserves to know at least what happened. Mark and Jason and, and, you know, unfortunately Margaret has passed, but you know, her memory, you know, she needs to be also unburdened mm-hmm. <clears throat> even in the afterlife or wherever she is that this killer is, you know, off the streets and not going to be perpetrating a crime that can affect a family and a community and a city or hell a state like it has. Right. And I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing all of your opinions and your theories on this case. And I know we've been talking for a pretty long time today. So I just wanted to say thank you. And, uh, did you have any any other things that you wanted to add? Well, I, I do have a question for you, okay? Sounds good. Obviously, um, and I, I think we may have talked about this before, but obviously if you could answer one question, who did it and why, uh, those, are your, those are the top two. But it, right. 
anything along the way that you've discovered or in your research of the case, if, is there any of the smaller questions, the things that may or may not matter, may or may not affect the outcome or result of this case? What are some of the smaller questions for you that you hope to answer to discover the answer or come to a conclusion? And is the podcast helping you in that direction? Well, I feel like the podcast, uh, you know, to answer the last question first is, is the podcast is generating, I receive emails every day about, I had this happen to me, or, you know, I think it might've been this individual. And you, you have people that believe, you know, certain theories that have already been put out there, you know, that mm-hmm. have been public, you know, published before. And there are a lot of people that are stuck on certain theories, I'm going to say that the thing, the little things that I've picked up on that are interesting of fact to me are the amount of dealerships that Mark Mahalovic serviced. And when I say serviced, he was a representative for General Motors. So he traveled around, talked to all sorts of different people from, you know, service department workers to dealership owners and there was a down in cincinnati the day that amy was abducted they were having a zone meeting their branch office or whatever was down there so one of the things that they did that mark told me was that amongst the buick family he raved about how great they were as a company but they would have these family picnics down in Cincinnati where you know the whole family would go right and so if you think about where you're at a company outing with your kids how much are you paying attention to what they're doing and who they're talking to and who's to say that this individual that did this to Amy couldn't have at least said, Hey, or just saw her and was like you had mentioned before, attracted to her, but it gives that, you know, it opens that Pandora's box that just never seems to shut as far as the amount of suspects that are out there. But that is one of those things that really stood out to me is there was an opportunity for older individuals to have, spoken to her before Mm -hmm. now again they said that they worked with margaret so you know that part could be a bit of misdirection but uh you know he just maybe again it's just speculation pure speculation but the fact that he was away mark was away that day at his own meeting down in cincinnati He wasn't expected to arrive home until six o'clock or later. Margaret, as you mentioned, she worked till five. Friday, it had to have been, it had to have been set up for that particular day. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because of those other two things, but there's a lot of significance that goes into the, to that day. So I feel like there's a lot of avenues you can follow in the, background of the Buick dealership family as far as you know all the different individuals that worked within those dealerships and then uh, just like the the idea that um, he could have actually met her before I, I don't know you know what's wild what if <laughs> and I, I know that I always do this every time we talk, we, we go, you go through something and then I'm like, well, what if this little thing here means something? But what if Mark Mahalovic says to the wrong guy, oh, they're bumping up my wife's work hours or they're taking her on full time. Thank God. Maybe she starts drinking less. And that guy goes, hmm, maybe that's the guy that met Amy at a picnic or saw her or saw a picture of her on, you know, from Mark. And 
goes, just, you know what? even had that intimate knowledge of that issue. And let's say right. that he knew that before he even saw her at a picnic or yeah, that was a situation that that could have arisen and use that as the. Hey. And you're right. Deflection, deflection from him and who he is. Um, you know, they start with the inner circle and work their way out when they're investigating who could have taken her. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, they sent, you know, they sent people immediately to interview people she worked with because that's, mm -hmm. you know, as it was what, 24 hours, 48 hours when they found that lead of the phone call and, and yeah, what may have been said Saturday during afternoon. the phone call. Yeah. It was that Saturday afternoon when they, the two. So by, so by Saturday night, Sunday morning, they're interviewing people that she worked with and they're not interviewing. They only have so many men and women on the force. If, if they're busy interviewing people she works with, then they're not available to interview people he works with. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things. Again, that, that whole idea of just using Margaret as misdirection, you, you know, we're not FBI, we're not investigators, but I'm sure they looked into that, but it does make you wonder if, if that wasn't just one of those easy things to say that ends up spinning the case in one direction that you didn't expect it to just automate, you know, if you say Margaret, okay, just like you said, you start working that circle and it does, it takes resources away from the other possibilities. Right. And it's not, again, they've, I've asked them, did you look into Mark's background? Yes. Does that mean they looked into Mark's background to as deep as, you know, the service people in the furthest dealership that he serviced? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. But I can tell you that within any job, you know, you're going to have shady individuals and within any of these dealerships, you have a lot of employees. So it could, uh, it could be like Spetzel said, a number of different people. And there are very, right. very few people that have been eliminated as suspects because they don't have, you know, the only people that have been eliminated are the people that have ironclad alibis mm -hmm. and majority of people don't. Right. And that's why there are just so many suspects still. So hmm. it leads you, you know, it doesn't, you don't want to think that it's a lost cause, but because of the fact that they have DNA, that's where we can hold our, you know, we can put our hope in science and that te technology and even the public, like the authorities really emphasize this to me. Listen, we want the public's help. We want the tip on the curtain. Somebody right. made that thing. You mentioned it in maybe in a previous conversation that that curtain was made. It was manufactured by somebody, not by a company for its purpose. It was repurposed for whatever it was used for and that wasn't just dumping the body right there was not a thousand of curtains a thousand curtains that look like that one there's likely one or this was part of a very few that were made by someone and it doesn't have to be the killer it, it could be that you know the killer's mom or aunt or grandmother or you know, father or somebody else made them, but th they were available to this individual for some reason. Right. You weren't going to just run out to Walmart and pick up a, pick up right. this curtain and hang it in your house. This was a handmade thing. So mm -hmm. if the public can somehow rem remember making that, you know, if you remember making that blanket or that curtain or turning that blanket into a curtain, you are, holding a key to this case and that person may be dead but if that person is still alive i mean they're holding on to a burden too you know right. because they if they see that curtain and they think oh i remember making that well guess what now you're connected to a murder so are they scared of the fact that yeah, they don't want to come forward but if that person's still alive, they're carrying a burden too. Yes. So.
my my thought is the person who made that blanket knew the killer and well knew the made the curtain knew the killer and if we can just put those two things together it can make this whole jumbled puzzle finally fit right and i just really feel like if we don't have the help of the public and you know the technology that we're working with today you know the case may never be may have never be so may never be solved but i am strongly in, in the belief that it will be solved and it will be solved sooner rather than later i hope so yeah so i appreciate the time nick i know it's been over an hour that we've been talking so it's a case that until it's solved it will f- continue to fascinate and haunt me at the same time and i more than eager to talk with people like you like James, you know, people that, that have a good knowledge and understanding of the case. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, I, I, I'm telling you, dude, I was actually, um, about 11 o'clock, 10 45, 11 o'clock. I kept looking at the clock, looking at my phone, looking at the clock, looking at my phone, because I was excited about having a conversation with you. And I, (laughs) I thought, I thought, damn, I wish we would have done this earlier because, um, (laughs) Because I, I, I was excited. Like I said, it's... Um, Honestly, it's one of those things. It's like you, you could go on and on and on about the amount of different avenues this place and this could go. <laughs> so I appreciate the time, Nick. I know it's been over an hour that we've been talking. So It's a case that until it's solved, it will f- continue to fascinate and haunt me at the same time. And I'm more than eager to talk with people like you, like James, you know, people that that have a good knowledge and understanding of the case. Thank you again to Nick for his insight into Amy's case. If you enjoy learning about different crimes, I cannot implore you enough to check out his podcast, True Crime Garage. It airs twice a week and goes deep into cases that may not be as well known. You can get all of their episodes for free if you download the Stitcher app. And if there is one episode, actually it's a four-parter, that I would love to recommend, that would be The Boys on the Tracks. This is a story that has so many rabbit holes and is truly worth your time. So again, many thanks to Nick from True Crime Garage. As we move into part two of this episode, I wanted the listeners to know that the suspects we discuss in the following segment are just that, suspects. Their names have been published in previous publications, But for people that are new to this case, it is important for them to hear why these people may or may not fit the bill. So let's jump into my previous conversation with true crime author James Renner, where we will hopefully answer some of the questions that the listeners have brought to my attention. This is James Renner, and you're listening to the Who Killed Amy Mihalovic podcast. Yeah, well, I mean, Frank Dennis is always going to be on the suspect list. Uh, simply because we know he's capable of murder. Um, Dennis was the guy who murdered uh, Joe Cop was his name, I believe. Um, this was several years ago. I think I want to say like mm, 2010-ish, 2009, somewhere around there. Anyways, this, uh, this guy, Frank Dennis, was living in... Um, Segmore Hills, and he was um, living with this woman, and uh, she had this this friend that was always over, and then there was this guy, Joe Cop, who was a very, he was well known around the neighborhood as this ex- eccentric um, fellow, and he would, uh, you know, he was homeless, essentially. So uh, Deannis gave Cop um, a place to stay in his garage. He let him live in his garage which is kind of weird and it's on its own. And uh, the rumor is that Cop was going around telling people that Dennis killed Amy Mihalovic. And then Cop goes missing. And uh, the friend of Dennis's wife or, or live-in girlfriend, um, she overhears some conversation. She quickly discovers that 
uh, Deanna's shot cop in the in the head and killed him and then buried him in his backyard. So uh, she goes to police with this information. It gets out. Of course, they go over. They they dig up the backyard. They find cop's body and they're like, oh, my God, you know, what do we have here? And, you know, at first everybody got excited, you know, because the Mihalovic connection, this guy killed him. Did he do it to silence him before he told anybody about him being guilty? Cop was going around saying that he knew that Deannis murdered Amy Mihalovic. Um, now, you know, so, of course, everybody gets excited when Deannis gets arrested for this murder. Um, I, I immediately start looking into it, and I find a connection to Ashland. So when um, back before Amy was abducted, Deannis... Uh, grew up not far from where Amy's body was found. I'd say probably about five miles. Uh, he lived in this on this farm, kind of, kind of off Route One Sixteen down there in Ashland County. So I drove out there, and it's very secluded. It's this very secluded barn, and. Uh, uh, I walked around, and it's a creepy place. Lots of, you know, nobody would hear you scream out there, uh, even today. It's uh, it's very isolated. So um, I was interested in that. I talked to his neighbors. Uh, the neighbors who remembered uh, Deannis as a young boy said that he used to take the steel neighborhood pets, like cats, and, and he would kill them and, uh, um, you know, do things to their their bodies, you know. Um, so he was, you know, not 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 a great guy. And so the more you look at him, the more interesting he becomes. And then we find out that Deannis did work on the Mahalovic's home. Um, now, there's a question as to whether or not he did work on the Mahalovic's home before or after Amy was abducted. And um, Mark Mahalovic I think for a while believed it was after, but I think now he's he's wondering if maybe it was before. I don't think anybody knows for sure. So here's what I think happened, though. I think cop learned that Deannis had been questioned by police, and, and he was, and he was looked at by police uh, early on, years before uh, Joe Cop was murdered. And I think probably what happened is Deannis was talking to Joe, because they were friends, he was letting Joe live in the house, and he mentioned this, and it's... Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Um, So, uh, I think at some point, Deannis mentioned that he had been questioned in the Amy Mihalovic case, and that stuck with the cop, and so that's what he was telling people. He's like, oh, he was questioned, I'll bet he did it. And, uh, but I don't think there was more than that the cop knew. That's my, just my hunch. Um, Did he have any other records? I don't think so. Um, I, I, I know what you're asking. I, I don't think there's anything else that's that, you know, certainly no other murders, but I don't think there was even any other assaults. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think, I think his record's pretty clean up to this, up to this murder. Um, so uh, now Deannis's story is, he was saying that cop, was threatening to harm his um, his wife uh, by she was I think she had an oxygen tank to breathe and and cop had been messing around with that and threatening them and threatening that if they kicked him out of the house he'd tell everybody that he that Deannis killed Amy Mihalovic um, so uh, then it came to a head one night and tried to get cop to leave. Um, but certainly no excuse for, you know, killing this man. There, There's probably a hundred other easier solutions to getting a man out of your garage than, than killing him. So who knows exactly how this all came together. Um, but, yeah, Deannis remains, I'm sure, in the top ten suspects that police and FBI have, and for good reason. He's not in my top three because I think there are more likely people, but Deannis is certainly uh, a big question mark. Um, I actually got the opportunity to talk to him. So um, 
when I heard that he was arrested, I went down to the county jail, and they have this the sign in sheet that you go up there if you want to talk to one of the prisoners. Yeah, this is at the Justice Center, downtown Cleveland. And uh, so I went in, and it says, are you a friend or are you an attorney? And I thought, well, I could be friends to anybody. you know. So I, I put my name under friend, and they called uh, Deannis, and he decided to meet with me. And so he came to – it was just like in the movies where um, – you know, he's behind that glass wall and, and I'm sitting there and he comes in his jumpsuit and he doesn't know who I am. He's got this look. He's like, you know, who are you? And we pick up the phone and we talk and, uh, you know, I tell him who I am and, you know, I start asking questions about, you know, did you have anything to do with Amy Mihalovic? Uh, you, did you work at, at the Mihalovic home? You know, why did you kill Joe Cop? And he was just pretending at that moment to be essentially... Um, he said something about a head injury, and he was he was pretending to be um, mentally handicapped. And uh, this actually came out later in the courtroom where the judge yelled at I not yelled at him, but um, admonished him for trying to pretend that he he wasn't as smart as he appeared to be. So I didn't get much out of him, other than a restraining order because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, his attorneys did. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think about Deannis a lot. You know, it goes back to this idea of are we dealing with more than one person, more than one suspect? I could see that. I could see Deannis being involved in that. I don't know that I could see Deannis if it was just one person. You know, if it was just Deannis taking uh, Amy from that plaza. I don't know that I could see that happening. I don't see Amy trusting Deannis because he's just a weird, weird dude. And on that note, when I spoke with Mark, you know, he had mentioned that Amy wouldn't have gone with anybody that she wasn't comfortable with or didn't know. So what does that leave you with? You got to you got to trust you got to trust the father's instinct there. Um, You know, I learned that from meeting with uh, the uh, Gina de Jesus's father and his name's Felix. And I remember speaking to him when his daughter was missing and he came up to me and he said, I know my daughter's alive. I'd feel it if she wasn't. And I just remember feeling so bad for him because I'm like, come on, you know, she's, she, she was murdered years ago, but he knew he was right. And so you, you always have to trust the instincts of, of the family there. So I, I tend to agree. Um, but you know, what does that mean? How well did she know this person? And and could it have been somebody she met uh, passing through the Nature Center? Um, could it have been somebody she met um, or she thought she knew um, that had worked with her mother, um, you know, and called her up on the phone and she just assumed that she knew this guy? Um, or at least that he knew her mother. So whoever it was, was really, really good at speaking with children, you know, um, and I don't, Deannis is not that type of guy. Another name that has come up in the podcast and in other publications is that of one William Strunak. He was a volunteer at the Amy Center and had even sent Margaret a gift while Amy was missing. Robert Ressler, one of the founders of the FBI's profiling department, came into town one weekend while Amy was missing and felt like he had a pretty good idea who the culprit was. Mind you, he was just in Bay Village for a couple of days, and when he published his book, Whoever Fights Monsters, there was an immediate backlash from other law enforcement that had worked on the case. As much as the four pages in his book made for interesting reading, they almost did more harm to this case than anything. Here you have a famous FBI agent writing in his book whom he thinks killed Amy Mihaljevic. This may have been the reason that the media attention on the case in the 1990s seemed to have stalled out for a bit. A police search of Strunak's apartment yielded a suicide note that made absolutely no mention of Amy Mihaljevic, but that was enough for Ressler to decide that he was the perfect fit for Amy's killer. James Renner has really pushed Amy's case back to the forefront of the Cleveland media. 
Renner had this to say about Strunak being referenced in a chapter of Ressler's book in one of his first articles about Amy's case for Cleveland Scene magazine. Quote, But the chapter also includes numerous inaccuracies. Ressler mistakenly wrote that Amy was 12 when she was abducted, not 10. And the Strunak family, he wrongly claimed, had discarded all evidence before police and FBI would conduct a search of the apartment. He described the site where Amy's body was found as being right off 71, when in fact it was a winding 15 miles away. Though he had only spent a weekend in Bay Village during the time Amy was missing, Ressler thought he knew better than the feds who had pursued her killer for months. This made Dick Wren furious. Quote, Those of us who were closely associated with the investigation do not believe that Strunak was the individual involved in that abduction and homicide. Because of that book, people might not have come forward with important information. They thought it was solved. Unquote. This is what James had to say about William Strunak when we sat down for our last interview. Um, yeah, Strunak is, is an interesting character. So the short story is that Bill Strunak uh, is... So after Amy goes missing, this um, this volunteer army is formed in Bay Village. Um, and I think they call it even the Amy Center, oh, right? Did They absolutely called it the Amy Center, and they were stationed out of the city hall. Yeah. And they had, I think, something like 50 volunteers. Yep. Um, basically papering. I mean, I, I know I've got the interview from back then with uh, Howard Kimball, mm. who was the man in charge yeah. of the, uh, the Amy Center. Yep. Um, so uh, they would print out, they would handle a lot of the flyer distribution. They were sending flyers out everywhere. Now, this guy comes in one day, Bill Strunak, and he has these reams of paper that he's donating. And they're like, oh, thank you very much. You know, thanks for the paper. Um, like he's, copy paper or? Yeah, yeah, copy paper for the flyers. And uh, so it turns out he had stolen those from his work. Uh and he was working at BJ's Wholesale uh, at the time. And now, Bill, the, the the first thing that you you think of when you see his picture is he looks wow. He really looks like the composite sketch. Um, but we've said that about a number of people. But 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 Bill certainly did. And uh, he creeped people out at the volunteer center. So eventually, he was kind of asked not to come back. And uh, so. It's always um, nice to be kicked out of a place that you're volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> so flash forward a little bit. Um, um, so uh, we'll edit that part out. <laughs> um, so flash forward to February 19th, and Strunak shows up at, uh, I think, Fairview Hospital. Um, and he is admitted and uh, quickly dies. And they, they find out that he was poisoned. He drank... Um, essentially they believe that, well, the police believed that he drank. Cue the police. Yeah. <laughs> um, they believe that he drank, uh, anti antifreeze. Um, like, uh, wasn't it like, um, I want to say it was like liquid gas or. Yes. Yeah, something like I that. I mean, like, liquid gas, that sounds so stupid, but, uh. Yeah. Um, the stuff that you put in your was, engine to treat it. It was something really awful let me see if it says it in the autopsy here um so anyways um yeah i don't think it says specifically um so uh they he dies at the hospital and they're like what what happened so they they send him to the corner the corner rules that he had, he drank some sort of substance mixed with coke um because he that morning he woke up went into work and he started complaining about stomach pains and then he was admitted to the hospital long story short the coroner rules it a suicide that he mixed poison of some sort uh probably um you know that gas solution or whatever um and drank it to commit suicide and so now he's got this connection to amy and that that uh volunteer center he looks like the composite sketch and now he's committed suicide so he becomes 
certainly a suspect in this case, and he was wrestler's favorite um, suspect, Robert Wrestler. Well, he names him in the, whoever in the book, yeah, fights monsters, and uh, I mean, he obviously, which is was, wild. Like, I how mean, did he? You know, well, yeah, I know, guess he's dead, so you can't, you know, sue for 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 anything at, at that point. But yeah, but yeah, you know, he went uh, he went out there and said, uh, no, I think it was this guy. Yeah. So um, and published it. Yeah, and and I think because of that, a lot of people up until the point where I started writing about it just assumed that it was Billy Strunak because he was he was there, there was a connection, and he committed suicide, so it must be him. Um, and because something like Amy's abduction and murder, there's not another crime like that in this region, and you would think somebody that would do that would be a serial killer. And so again, that goes back to well, it must be Billy Strunak because they stopped. Um, and, uh, so, oh, another thing about Strunak is we know he was a bad guy. Um, he is, uh, he does have a record and he was convicted a couple years before, um, he tried to get this 16 year old waitress from a restaurant that he frequented. He tried to pull her into his car and she escaped and called the police. He got in trouble for that. He also stole some like Indians tickets and stupid stuff like that, but, um, he certainly had a thing for young girls. So all that, you're like, wow, this guy's a really good suspect, especially given the fact that he's committed suicide. But I'm here to tell you, Billy Strunak did not commit suicide. It was murder. And so cue the music here. Whoa, okay. <clears throat> um, dum, dum, dum. A couple of years after my book came out, I was contacted by this woman who worked for um and I should preface this as saying I said it was murder. I'm I'm saying I believe in my opinion that it probably was murder um and not suicide. And here's why. Um a couple years after my book came out, I was contacted by this woman who was part of that volunteer army looking for Amy. And she told me that um she and Bill uh I wouldn't call it a thing, but he was very infatuated with her. And she was kind of okay with that to an extent. Um, and he, they end up going to the Mihaljevic's house near Christmas. Um, they had this gathering, I think it might have even been December 11th, 1989, which was Amy, would have been Amy's 11th, 11th birthday. birthday. So they were there. Margaret had a little get together for the volunteers. <laughs> And this woman alleges that after that party, she goes back and is walking back, and Bill's walking with her, and they get to his van, and he, she's standing next to him, and he grabs the van's door and, and slams it into her face, kind of stunning her, and then he pulls her into the van, rapes her in a van in front of the Mihaljevic house, and I know automatically you're thinking, no, no way. No way did this happen. That's what I thought, too. There's proof of it, though, because, or at least proof that they had an encounter because she became pregnant, and she gave this baby up for adoption, and the baby ended up with a, um, uh, a young couple in Pepper Pike and probably to this day doesn't know who his dad really was. So... Um, all this happened, um, allegedly and this woman was married at the time, but kind of, uh, I, I maybe separating or, or distant from her husband. So that she tells me the story about the, the, the rape and, and Strunak and, uh, dry gas. Yes. Dry gas. Um, so he, the, the story was he ingested dry gas and, and committed suicide that way. So, uh, after the book comes out, she tells me this story about the rape, and uh, that ends up in the book. I How old? I, I mean, you might have mentioned it. I just uh, might have just been not paying attention. How old was she when she was raped? I think she was in her late twenties, early thirties, maybe. So Strunak would have been same young. age, somewhere around there. Okay, so okay, I think uh, I forget his his exact age, but. Not, not and too... this is the thing. This is what occurred on December 11th. That's oh yeah, allegedly this is what she's saying. Yeah, it, in a van in front of the Mahalovic house, this this rape occurred. So, um, she uh, now 
it is verified to an extent because she talked she told her husband that that's what happened and that's how she became pregnant and he to me verified those details now after my book came out and the story came out the husband called me and he said i have to tell you something and it's been bothering me for years he said when uh strunak died um i was missing one of my pharmacology books and i was looking everywhere for it this man was a pharmacist and he couldn't find his main book on 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 drugs and he he knew where it was and it was just gone after strunak died his wife comes home with the book and he said what are you doing with that and she said don't worry i took care of it and he said what do you mean and she said well um i found um Essentially, she she told him, according to... The story is she put poison in a bottle of Jack Daniels and presented it to Strunak as a gift. And we know that he loved Jack and Cokes. That's what he would make himself to drink. He, Strunak was a alcoholic, right? I don't know an alcoholic, but he, he definitely liked to drink. He w- he drank a lot, and he w- and his drink of choice was Jack of C- Jack and Cokes. So, according to the husband, the wife comes home with his book, says, "I found the right poison to give him. I put it in a bottle of Jack Daniels. I gave it to him as a gift. We don't have to worry about him ever again." Now, they the one thing we know is that he drank something in Coke. They assumed the coroner assumed it was dry gas, and then he did it on purpose. But the husband's telling me that no, it was tainted Jack Daniels that he mixed with his Coke, and that's what killed him. It wasn't suicide. It was it was revenge. So the key of that story is don't drink Jack and Cokes. Right. <laughs> right. Or, and, or at least if they're gifted to you in a bottle. <laughs> so my, my thought, is, and I tend to believe this story, as weird as it sounds, because there are some things that can be verified. And I, so I tend to believe it. It makes more sense in my mind than somebody, it's a weird way to commit suicide. It's a weird way to commit suicide, and it would explain it. So if it was if it was murder, um, and I would say manslaughter there because I don't, you know, this guy certainly deserved maybe a little killing. Um, so um, if that's what it was, then I don't think he can really be a suspect because the whole reason we, the police, considered him such a strong suspect was that he committed suicide. But if we take that off the table... He's no no more interesting than half a dozen other men. Right. And that's that's the thing about this case is, you know, once you, you look at any one of these suspects and stories, and, and, and if you peel back the layers a little bit, it just gets so absurd and weird, you know? Is it a suicide? Is it a murder? William Strunak may not have fit the bill, But there was another character that came up in a number of publications, and that was the farmhand from Holly Hill Farm, one Harold Bound. So uh, for the first 11 weeks of the investigation after Amy went missing, Dick Wren uh, was laser-focused on this man named Harold Bound. And, uh, you know, we can talk about him because his name is public, and even Bound has spoken about this before. And you wrote about him in your book, right? Yep, yep. Bound worked at... As well as DNS. Yeah. Well, I, I, DNS happened after the book, but okay. I have written about him. Okay. Yep. And Spetzel's even come out and essentially said that DNS is a, is a suspect. You know, he's very interested in talking to him and, and speaking. So... Okay. We know DNS is, is somewhere in the mix um, as a potential person of interest. Uh, so Bound, back to Bound, Harold okay. Bound. Weird dude, uh, Vietnam vet, uh, was living... Um, in the top floor of the farmhouse in front of Holly Hill Stables, which is where Amy took riding lessons. Uh, I think that's out on Noggle Road, or was. The, it was no, just... It did, it's not there anymore? It was just torn down about two months ago. Oh, no kidding. I still have... I have some... Uh, I have some pictures of the farm. Oh, wow. Uh, that I took, what I mean, back in 08. Oh, okay. Uh, just of, like, the sign and... Mm. You know, just wanted to uh, document basically, you know, where where that was. So good that good that I have that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that there's some interesting stories about my investigation into this because at the time I was looking into this and I heard Bound's name, 
I was a very um, er, young reporter, very naive. This was my first big story. Uh, where, this was 2005, early 2005. Do you miss those days? I kind of do because, <laughs> you know, working for Scene Magazine at the time, it was so much fun. And it was at a time where those alt weeklies were doing crazy business. Yeah. I mean, I did... I didn't work for scene, but I did write. I was the A&E editor for the Cauldron at Cleveland State. Oh, great. So it was a twice a week newspaper, and I basically wrote five articles a week. Wow. It seemed like. Um, but it was all arts and entertainment. And people read newspapers back then. That was, you know, we nobody, had a nobody really knew. Nobody really knew how to work the the internet yet. Oh my! You know? So nobody got their news from the internet. Everybody still had the physical copies. Again, it goes back to how we got screwed when school. Yeah, you know, because Twitter came out and Facebook and the internet, and everybody gave everything away for free, and uh, everybody <laughs> got fired. Yep. Yeah. 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 So now we're using podcasts as the new form of honestly. Honestly, if you want to think about it, it's it's gone full circle. Like we're back to radio. We're back to radio. Yeah. And it's a different form of ingesting it as far as through a phone or through a c- computer. But in the all true yeah. sense of the word, it's long form narrative storytelling. Yeah. You know, in a serial form. James Renner has a top 10 list of suspects that he believes may have been responsible for the abduction and murder of Amy Mahalovic. He expands a little bit on that list. Uh, he's in my top 10. Okay. I'll put it at that. You know, <laughs> I, I think the, the top 10 is very fluid. You know, people come in and come out. Um, and, you know, I don't run the blog anymore. Uh, you know, I don't really post to the blog. Right. Uh, and I've taken a lot of the blog down over the years, um, you know, just because I took all the information that named suspects down uh, because, you know, the, the police and the FBI were never happy about that. And, my litmus test, by the way, for naming people as suspects were, you know, one, I got another suspect, but two, um, I would only name them if they had a history of violence towards women or children. So, How would you know if they were a suspect? Um, would you, I mean, what was the process of finding well, I out would if they hear, were a suspect? Or, that's a good question, because originally I would hear it as a rumor, right? Oh, this person was questioned. This person was a suspect. Um, I would get it verified one of two ways, either by law enforcement, police, or, or FBI, or... 50% of the time, it was the suspect themselves that would, would verify it. They, they would tell me, yeah, I'm a suspect in the case. They it come out and they interview me every once in a while. They've taken my DNA. If I knew they took their DNA, they're a suspect, you know, or were at, at, at one time. So, you know, oddly enough, it's usually the suspect that verifies it, uh, which is, blows my mind that people just want to admit and, and talk about that. So... Um, get off the oh oh so you know I I haven't done much with um much online with the blog lately but that doesn't mean that I'm not working on it uh, I still get tips uh, weekly about Amy's case uh, and I'll look at them and sometimes they're interesting sometimes they present a new suspect um, in fact after our interview today I'm driving out to Willoughby to um, speak to, and I think we can mention, the, we're, I'm going to mention this guy's name because he's dead. Okay. Um, his name's uh, Gene George. Um, and uh, this guy was um, kind of a well-to-do uh, local guy, I believe he lived in Bay Village, but somebody told me weeks ago that the police questioned him, and then he committed suicide like a week later. And this was recent, like they recently questioned him and then he committed suicide. So I looked into it. I haven't been able to verify that it's a suicide, but this guy left, just up and left Ohio, drove out to hike in the, in, in this t- really tall mountain, I think, in, in, yeah, Colorado. So he, he leaves, he climbs this mountain and he disappears and nobody finds him for like weeks and eventually the, the police, during a search, they find his parts of his body. Um, and they still don't exactly know how he died initially, but his body parts were found in various animal dens. Um, so uh, he met an untimely 
fate there. What I'm trying to do is verify how much um, the police or FBI looked into him. Um, so I'm, I'm heading out to Willoughby today to speak with one of his, his relatives. What would the... Did they give you any idea on what his connection to Bay Village is? No, I'm still trying to... I'm still trying to figure. Well, I think he lived in Bay Village, um, but I'm still trying to f figure out the connection between him and and Amy. What that would have been. But I know you got to go. Yeah, uh, it's we'll do this again. Thirty. We're gonna do it again. Obviously, <laughs> continuing uh, this we saga. Could, we could talk for five hours just on suspects. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. So I do appreciate you coming in yeah. again. Coming up next week on episode nine of Who Killed Amy Mahalovic. Well, if I was here in town, I'd get home at 6, 6.30, a little bit later. Um, if I was out of town, of course, I might, might be gone for you know, two or three days. He could have been any age, really. I mean, we, we have a range of about 25 to 35, roughly, for this individual. Uh, the best the FBI had ever been able to do was narrow it down to a list of top, uh, a top 25. And when I realized that, it was it was... You know, it changed the whole way I viewed the world. And, uh, you know, is it something about Amy in particular? Or is every case like this? You know, do you always have this number of, you know, all these creeps checking out these girls? Or was it something about Amy? Thank you again to Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast and true crime author James Renner for their invaluable insights into Amy's case and the suspects that may be involved. Thank you again for listening, and stay tuned for next week's episode, Episode 9, Who Do You Think Killed Amy Mahalovic? On that episode, we will take a look at some of the different theories that have come in since this podcast began back in August. If you are interested in supporting independent journalism, such as this podcast, you can click on the donate button on the bottom left on whokilledamymahalovic.com. If you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, that will also help support the show and help get Amy's story the coverage it deserves. You can contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234 if you have any new information. The FBI is offering a reward up to $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the death of Amy Renee Mahalovic. Anyone with information concerning this case, please contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Thank you again for listening, and be safe.